Okay, good morning. A small but mighty group here today. I'm looking forward to uh, jumping into the subject matter at hand, but let me, before I get into introductions, let me give you a quick orientation as to what we're up to today. Uh, we're gonna have a great conversation driven by your questions about getting into the laundromat industry. Uh, we're using the GoToWebinar platform, and so you have a little control panel in the upper right-hand part of your screen that allows you to sort of uh, dial in the settings. Uh, but most importantly, I wanted to point out uh, two of the options. One, uh, you can see Andrew from our team in the chat, so feel free to introduce yourself, where you're from, uh, what you're up to. And then there's a questions box that you can also expand and type into. And that'll be the best way for me to see your questions in real time on my screen. And while I've got some prepared content, I'm always, always very happy to pause and take uh, your questions as we go along. So uh, that's one thing I wanted to share with you. The other thing that I wanted to mention uh, is that uh, we have a recording. Uh, we're recording this presentation. And so you will automatically, as a registrant, get a copy of the presentation. It takes about a day to render, uh, but you'll get a copy of this in your inbox. So you're welcome to take notes, of course, but just know that you're gonna receive a copy of the presentation that you can review yourself or share with other people on your team that are considering this uh, investment in the laundromat industry. So uh, let me begin by introducing Coin Laundry Association. We are the uh, trade association for the laundromat professionals. Uh, we have thousands of uh, laundromats that are among our membership, and we have been doing this for more than 60 years now. So we've got this incredible knowledge base of people that have come before you in the business, and uh, we have an expertise uh, about this industry that very few would be able to bring to the table. And so we like to do these monthly Q&A webinars uh, for those of you that are thinking about getting into the industry, just because I know you've got so many questions, you're excited, you wanna jump in, and uh, I'm here to help you uh, navigate those questions. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of the resources that we have here at the association to help you along this journey. Uh, but uh, let me back up a step and go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brian Wallace, I serve as president and CEO of the Coin Laundry Association. I've got more than 30 years experience and have literally worked with thousands, thousands of first time laundromat owners, uh, taking your questions every day over the course of that 30 plus years. So I really hope to sort of synthesize some of the information that I know that you're interested in in the, in the following slides, but like I said, also be available to take your individual questions as they uh, come along here. So uh, let's get rolling. Uh, again, find the uh, chat there if you want to introduce yourself and uh, uh, talk with some of the other attendees. Use the questions box, if you will, to type in your most uh, burning questions about getting into the laundromat industry. So let's get started with some of the prepared content and uh, feel free to interrupt anytime with your questions. So um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, get started with is just kind of an overview of the, of the industry here in the United States. Uh, about 29,000 laundromats, and when I say laundromat, I could also say coin laundry, coin op laundry, washeteria, lavanderia, laundrette. We're basically talking about uh, making self-service laundry equipment available in a retail space to the general public. And so what I'm not talking about is the vended laundry equipment you would find in an apartment setting or dormitory, some other kind of multi-family setting, uh, really focused on kind of the laundromat store, if you will. So um, that is really uh, sort of the definitionally what we're all about here. And as we'll talk about, we also have additional services on the full service laundry side, whether it be wash, dry, fold, pick up and delivery, some of those uh, really pertinent trends that are happening in the industry today. So in terms of industry size for that segment that I just defined, it's north of $6 billion at this point in annual sales um, among those stores. Now, statistically speaking, the average size of a laundromat these days is about 2,500 square feet, uh, but certainly any new stores going in tend to be larger than that. Uh, you're more likely to see uh, 3,500 perhaps is an uh, is a um, example, 
And but believe me, I just talked to a member this morning in New Hampshire with about a 1,200 square foot store. I'm going to New York City tomorrow, and I'll certainly see stores that are uh, 8,000 square feet or even larger. So the size of the laundromat tends to be sort of scaled to the demand and the demographics of the area. So you can have a very successful 1,000 square foot store and certainly a very successful 8 or 10 or 12,000 square foot store, although those are rare on either end of the, of the spectrum. So just giving you some uh, you know, ways to kind of anchor yourself about the conversation. Now, the uh, this use the same example. This uh, member that I consulted with this morning had a couple of locations. In some cases, he owns the real estate. In other cases, he is uh, leasing that space from the landlord. So I would say uh, most laundromat owners are leasing their space in a, a multi-tenant commercial real estate setting uh, with the goal often to uh, purchase the real estate and have that uh, you know, further enhance the investment. Who are we here to serve? We're providing self-service laundry is our core service and we're providing it to a whole range of customer groups. But if we had to zero in on the most important uh, core demographic, I would uh, speak about renter occupied households overlaid with low to mid income households. And obviously often the same folks meeting both of those criteria. So talking about folks that either don't have access to a washer dryer and or can't afford a washer dryer in their own living space. And so those are the people that we're encouraging to take that laundry, take those large loads, uh, come to our facility where they can uh, be done uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, some of the market research that we've done over the years kind of leads me to a little bit of a motto uh, with respect to customers. Laundromat customers are looking for time savings and convenience in a clean, safe environment that's close to home. Time savings and convenience in a clean, safe environment that's close to home. So if you really want to start to zero in on your value proposition or what people are looking for, uh, that's a good place to begin with what's important to customers. So the demographics, uh, renter occupied households, lower income households, and that equates to about almost 20 million people uh, a week here in the United States. So that's a table setter. So I'll take uh, a chance to say hi to uh, Javaris and uh, Micah, Zachary, Darren, and others of you, uh, thank you for joining in and, and feel free to start uh, punching in your questions as we go along. What I thought I'd do in this next section is explain that our job here at the association uh, is not to recruit you into the industry or to kind of oversell the business. I think it's our job to give you a sober, uh, cogent, um, level-headed look at the industry. Uh, obviously, there's things we love about the business and we're very excited to share, but I also wanted to balance that with some of the challenges or pitfalls or you know, other types of um, you know, headwinds that might come your way as you think about jumping into the business. So in this next section, I'm gonna give you some of the things that our members love about the business and then balance that off with some of the challenges, again, just to give you a level-headed look at the industry. So let's start on the good foot. Let's talk about some of the things that our members love about the industry and use that as a, a way to get us started. Recession resistant. This is sort of a, I wanna say controversial, but it's an often talked about descriptor of the industry. Is this recession proof, recession resistant, um, pandemic proof or pandemic resistant? But certainly let's start with calling this an essential business, an essential service. And certainly through the uh, COVID pa pandemic, uh, we made that official with uh, state governments and later uh, in the process of the federal government deeming us as an essential business with those handful of uh, businesses that were allowed to stay open during the in sort of the teeth of the, the pandemic. Um, so I think people like the fact that this is a basic level service. People need it, rain or shine, good times and in bad. And yes, in prior recessions, I've been around long enough to have uh, been part of the industry through those economic uh, upturns and downturns. And yes, you know, no, it's not fun. Uh, to go through an economic downturn. It's not perfect. Uh, uh, it's certainly the pandemic was terrible, but um, our industry tends to hold its own and uh, understanding the fact that, again, this need for clean clothes is essential. It's every day, it's every week, it's every month. And that stable, steady, reliable, some would say boring, but 
predictable elements of the business are very attractive to, to our members. Um, now, I like to call the business simple to operate, uh, easy, you know, harder to execute. So simple does not mean easy. Simple means uh, you need to find a good location. You need to have uh, great parking uh, for people to conveniently access your facility. Uh, you need to have equipment that's up and running at all times. The place needs to be immaculately clean, and it really helps to have a smiling face behind the counter uh, with your, uh, uh, your attendants, uh, the, the folks that are working for you in the store. So, Ken, getting back to that clean, safe, uh, convenient environment that's close to home, those are the basics. Now, executing on that is a different story. Uh, we see people that are very successful in doing that, and if you spend any time sort of uh, perusing the local laundromats in your area. I'm sure you're seeing everything from uh, D minuses and uh, 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 C pluses up to uh, B pluses up to A, A plus uh, ratings in your own mind of walking into the store. Uh, so you see this uh, variation that's often driven by how successful that store owner is and executing on those principles on a day-to-day -day basis. Kind of the difference between a palace and a zombie mat uh, typically has a lot to do with you as the owner operator. Um, I reject the notion that this is a absentee or passive business. And I know that it's often characterized as such uh, in social media spaces, but uh, I don't buy it. I've not seen this uh, in my 30 years be a passive or absentee business. What I have seen is a business that offers a, a lot of flexibility. Um, like anything else, you need to put the time in, uh, but because we're seven days a week, 16, 18 hours a day, in some cases, 24 hours a day, uh, nearly every day of the year, um, it is a matter of having flexibility of when you want to spend those times. So we have early birds, we have night owls, we have people that catch up on the weekends, we have people that have day jobs and, and, and uh, spend their time at the laundromat before and after uh, sort of their career job. So um, the flexibility is really what I hear most about our members beyond the profitability of the business is flexibility. You know, I like to drive my kids to school or I like to coach, uh, co coach basketball. These are the kind of things I hear a lot about the business. What I don't hear is I show up once a week and I collect the quarters. That's not what I hear. So um, I think that's uh, worthy of um, you know, your consideration. So yes, no one's in the love for this, uh, for the love of doing laundry. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that people are looking for to be a profitable business. Uh, cash in advance, and really what I'm saying here is that you're not dealing with receivables, you're not dealing with inventory to a large extent. Some of the complications of other small businesses really aren't there when it comes to the laundromat business. People swipe a card or drop a quarter and the machine starts and, and that simplicity is uh, something that we like. Uh, conducive to multi-store operation, increasingly, uh, the single store operator becoming harder and harder to find. More of you are saying, I like to build two or three or four or five of these over a period of time. And I think that that um, is a trend that's very likely to continue on, on that scale. That being said, and I'll get to your question uh, here in a moment, Casey, about franchises. There are, it's a highly fragmented industry, highly, highly fragmented. Of this 29,000 stores out there, um, I could probably count the number of 100 store operators on one or two fingers. Uh, those that have more than 50, I could count on one hand. And even you start lowering that threshold to even 30 stores, I'm probably counting on two hands out of the entire industry. So um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of independently owned and operated stores. Uh, there are no uh, significant franchises. And what I mean by that in terms of number uh, numbers, you're making a dent. Uh, you know, it, even at a 1% uh, level of that number I shared earlier, uh, there aren't really any chains beyond a, a, a regional footprint, uh, certainly nothing on a national basis. So what a lot of our members read from that is that me as an individual, I can go out and build a world-class laundromat and be as successful as the largest operators in the industry. I can do that with my first store, my second store, my third store. And I think that's something that's worth keeping in mind. Those of you that have been in business before will definitely have a leg up, but uh, just want to give a word of encouragement to those of you where this would be your first endeavor into small business ownership, you can do it too. Uh, just a little bit steeper learning curve, 
And certainly here at the association, we're ready to help you navigate that. So uh, thank you for populating some questions here in the meantime. So Casey asking, uh, speak about pros and cons of franchise versus going it alone, uh, as well as how to find a good location. So Casey, I'm gonna first take issue, uh, not issue, but explain further uh, the relativity of franchise versus going it alone. Franchise is fairly new concept to our industry within the last couple of years. Uh, we've got three or four active franchises that are up and running right now. Uh, the feedback I'm getting is that they're doing a great job. And I think what they're offering to potential first time folks is kind of a package, uh, something that's uh, already put together, uh, something that is uh, hopefully they can demonstrate to you a proven uh, concept in terms of branding and design and in the physical space of the store uh, as well as uh, the marketing um, and I think that is appealing to many of you they're looking for a little bit of a, uh, a shortcut or something that's uh, already put together in a package but I don't think the other option is going it alone I think what uh, would be uh, better suited is to talk about by far the most common entry path to the industry which is engaging with a local commercial equipment um, distributor. So let me go through a little bit of an explanation of how that typically works in our business. So any of your geographic areas, your market, uh, you're going to have an authorized distributor for each of the major brands of washers and dryers. Uh, and they have that as their established sales channel. So uh, those distributors are, yes, they're there in a sales capacity uh, to help you uh, make a purchase of brand A, B, C, or D. We're brand agnostic uh, here at the association. Um, but let me explain the scope of services, potential services that uh, you could expect from a professional commercial laundry equipment distributor. One, uh, they should be in a position to have this an introductory conversation with you, uh, giving you their input on the industry specifically as it relates to the market that you're interested in. They're often in a position to help you uh, either source a location or help you evaluate a location that you bring to the table. Uh, they should be in a position to conduct a professional demographic analysis of the area, uh, which is to look for these key uh, client groups and see what the demographics have to say about the demand uh, for additional laundromat capacity in the area. They should have been in a position to assist you with a competitive analysis, looking at the other laundromats that are already in the market. They should be in a position to take that information and convert it into a, a couple of things, a pro forma, a projection for said store, backed with a recommended equipment mix uh, that fits the footprint that you're looking at. So X number of washers of this size and that size, X number of dryers, kind of rounding out what that should look like. If you decide to move forward with the project, they should be in a position to quarterback uh, the build out of the store. So whether that is uh, serving directly as a GC, of course, for a price, uh, but at very least pointing you to contractors and trades who have experience in building laundromats. Uh, this is not something where you want to uh, go it alone uh, when it comes to plumbing, electrical, carpentry. Uh, remember with a laundromat, you're really building a factory. You're building a production facility. And so you really need to work with someone who really knows how to do it. That same distributor should be helping to uh, keep an eye on the construction and the build out, offering their expertise for the laundromat specific elements. And then they should be there to uh, install the equipment once it's ready uh, and test the equipment to make sure that it's up and running, uh, assist you with uh, grand opening ideas, and then uh, be able to offer uh, service contracts to help you maintain that equipment after the sale. So that whole continuum are the sort of things that are very typical and routine uh, through that commercial laundry equipment distributor relationship. So yes, uh, a franchisor is going to kind of package all that uh, together uh, under their roof, but also understand that going it alone, uh, I would better say go with a local distributor who is accustomed to providing that wide scope of services. So Casey, I hope that's helpful to you. Um, before I get into the next part, let me go ahead and uh, try to answer a few more questions here. Yasmin's question is how much management time uh, would a small or mid-sized store require? Yeah, that's a really tough one to answer. I kind of alluded to that a moment ago. I hear a lot of people talk about 20 hours a week, 15 to 20 hours a week for, for a, laundry, a simple laundromat operation. 
Um, that could be the case. Uh, I think that what you tend to find is you start here. Um, when you first buy that store, or build that store, uh, it's, it's a complete takeover of your life, <laughs> right? You're trying to uh, get this store up and running or you're taking over a store. And uh, over time, you start to build systems. You start to build efficiencies with your time and what needs to be done in the store. And typically, um, over that time of ownership, you start to uh, winnow down the amount of time that you're spending there given that efficiency and also deploying your staff in such a way to uh, further limit the amount of time that you spend in the store. So I think that answer is different for everyone, Yasmin. It's not zero, uh, it's not two hours, but I hear a lot of people, once they're up and running, you know, talk about somewhere in that 15 to 20 hour range. But again, your experience may be different, it may be more. I've got plenty of members that are putting in 50 hours a week on multiple locations. Uh, 60 hours a week. So it really depends on your circumstance and what you're trying to bring to the table. Um, let's see, how do you identify a good location to start a laundromat? So Stephanie, I, I uh, alluded to that a moment ago. You know, some of the key factors, the real two key factors that I just mentioned, uh, demographic analysis and competitive analysis. So speaking a little bit more about demographics, demographics really speak to the demand, right? The more people, the more dirty clothes. The more renters, the more people that are less likely to have their own washer dryer. Uh, people that, uh, the more lower income folks, again, the, the, the more uh, potential clients that can't afford their own washer dryer. Uh, persons for household, you know, kids means more laundry. You know, so that's another factor that people uh, will look for. So demographics is really trying to look at the area, look around the neighborhood and try to get a feel for how much uh, demand is there and is there a predominance of the demographic characteristics that we like to look for in the laundromat business. Uh, we have a great white paper on that. If you wanna take a deeper dive, uh, any professional local uh, distributor should have strong opinions uh, and be able to stand behind a demographic analysis of a potential location. Uh, the other factor I mentioned earlier was a competitive analysis. So think about laundry. Um, there's a finite amount of laundry in any circle you wanna put on a map. Um, and every single wash load is being done somewhere else the day before you open your new store, right? There's no latent need, there's no warehouse full of dirty laundry waiting for you to open. But there's an opportunity for you to uh, capture uh, the lion's share of laundry from the other options by doing it better, right? So it really begins with understanding the uh, laundromat competition, uh, both in uh, quantity and quality. Uh, I often recommend that one of the best things you can do is go out and do a lot of laundry. You know, keep a load of laundry in your car. When you see a laundromat, you've got uh, an hour to spend, stop in and do some laundry. First of all, you're gonna learn if this is something you wanna do, you're gonna learn what you like and what you don't like. And if that store happens to be in the area that you're considering for your store, uh, start grading it out. Start taking an inventory of how many parking spaces, what's the square footage, how many washers of each size, what are their VEN prices, uh, give them a grade for cleanliness. You know, really start to paint the picture of that. Uh, because you can say, well, Brian, I'm looking at uh, an area, there's only one store within a half mile, okay. Well, is that one store hasn't been touched in 30 years and uh, looks like a train wreck? Or is that one store within a half mile, a uh, 7,000 square foot mega store that's bright, gleaming, shiny, everything's new, parking like crazy, and they're doing an amazing job, right? So you know, an example there of you really need to dig into the quantity and quality of competition. And I think that goes for the apartment side too. Remember most laundromat customers are being pulled out of the apartment space. And so you can also take a look at, are these older post-war um, uh, apartment buildings that are less likely to have washers and dryers available to their clients? Or are these brand new uh, apartment buildings where they're likely to have not only having washers and dryers, but there's a washer and dryer in each unit, uh, which is akin to a, a home washer situation. So. We can go on and on about demographics. We've got webinars on it. We've got um, uh, white papers on the subject. I consult with our members all the time on these questions, but that gives you a little flavor of the things that you look for uh, for a good location. Beyond that, you need to look at the physical plant. Uh, that's things like 
Um, how is it oriented to the road? Is it highly visible or is it tucked in the back? Is it in the elbow of the center that you can barely see it or is it in an end cap where it's easily accessible? Um, these are the sort of things, is there a wicked left turn you need to take to get into the facility or is there easy ingress and egress? So there's a lot to take into consideration for a laundromat location. And again, one of the best things you can do is go out and do a lot of laundry. Okay, Carrie's question is, we're in a small town, less than 1,200. Is this a possible problem? Well, uh, Carrie, I think I wouldn't say a problem per se, because most small towns need at least one uh, good laundromat. Now, it's not going to be 7,000 feet, and it's not going to be attended. Um, it's going to be sort of right-sized to the area. It's not going to be a high-volume store, but it could still uh, generate a, a significant profit margin for you. So uh, I think that um, if you kind of take those considerations uh, you know, in, into your thought process, I think you can be very successful with small-town laundromats. They just have to be built for the task at hand, and they need to, uh, you need to understand that you're probably not gonna replace an income uh, for, for you or your, or your spouse that might be working together on the business, uh, but it can be a profitable side business. And I should mention that a lot of the multi-store operations uh, among our members are in these small town settings, you know, where they might sort of uh, dot the landscape and they might have a wider uh, footprint. Maybe it's more of a, uh, 15 or 20 miles as opposed to a mile or a mile and a half. Uh, but again, that's the beauty of the business. Everybody needs laundry services. And if done right, small town stores uh, can be just as successful just managing those expectations in terms of revenues. Carrie, we have a location we need help with designing and equipment and build out. How would you find this without a franchise? That's precisely the common, uh, the 99% model, which is the uh, using the local commercial laundry equipment distributor uh, would provide all of those services that you asked for. Darren's asking, would financing be something that the local distributor could help with? Absolutely, because uh, they have a, you know, they have an, an interest in selling you equipment, so they want to make sure that they've got the ability to help you finance the purchase of that equipment. And it's a good time to talk a little bit about how financing works in the industry. I've got a few more slides on that a little bit later, but generally speaking, uh, most of the financing that happens in our industry would be through what I would call captive lenders. Uh, laundromat specific lenders uh, that know the business are often aligned with one of the equipment manufacturers uh, and they are really there to create kind of our own credit facility within the industry uh, under the basis that uh, at least for most of our first timers you know commercial uh, I should say conventional lenders uh, the local bank the community bank is generally not making small business loans and or does not have an interest in the laundromat business and or requires two or three years experience. And so knowing what some of those long-term limitations have been in accessing financing to uh, fuel these projects, the industry sort of created its own um, uh, you know, ecosystem when it comes to financing. And so uh, that's something that's quite common. So I'll get into this a little bit further here as we go, uh, but that's the, the short answer to get us started. So thank you for that, Darren. Tiffany's, do distributors have to stay within their region? We have researched who is available and only one shows for our area. We met with them, however, we are not extremely satisfied with our dealings. Uh, what other options do we have? So, uh, and I can help you with this, Tiffany. Each of the major brands will have a distributor that covers your area. You know, so um, distributors are typically limited to the one or two lines that they're representing in your territory. But there are other distributors uh, that are representing the other brand, the, the other brands. So if I'm thinking off the top of my head, the five, six, seven different uh, washer brands, each of them will have a distributor that covers your market. So that's where your choice comes in, uh, being able to uh, measure and compare. And uh, one of the recommendations that I often make, Tiffany, is to try to set appointments with all three, four, five, six, seven distributors that cover your market. And you're going to, through that process, like you did on, on, on the one that you've met with so far, you're going to have a good sense of who you want to work with and who you don't want to work with in terms of what they're offering, just kind of the fit uh, in, in terms of uh, their approach to doing business and, you know, kind of matching the, the types of needs that, that you're looking for. So 
uh, each and every one of the washer manufacturers has a representative for your area. Okay, you're welcome, Yasmin. Well, let me take a pause here before I get to Aaron and Darren again, uh, make sure I get through a little bit more of this prepared content, but great job. It's a lot more interesting, hopefully for all of us, if we're uh, using your Q&A, and chances are I've got a slide here where we can kind of circle back to some of those uh, uh, things. So remember I said I was gonna give you some reasons that our members love the business and uh, embrace it and wanna do more. And I thought I would balance that with some of the challenges that I hear from you on an each and every day basis. Probably the number one challenge that I hear from you uh, on a regular basis is that upfront money, that, that initial investment, the capital that it, that's required to get into the industry. Now that's a painting with a very broad brush. If I asked all of you on the call to jot down what you consider to be a large investment, I'm sure we get a whole variety of, of answers. But that upfront, that first time in the business is usually the largest uh, obstacle. Now some of you have a strong balance sheet, you've got real estate, you've got another business, that's wonderful and that's just gonna be an easier path for you. But for, for most, you know, there is a bit of a challenge getting started. So let's talk about this a little bit further. Um, Existing stores, I talked to a member last week, they're seeing stores listed for a couple hundred thousand and seeing stores listed for a couple of million. Yes, I mean that depending on the market that you're in, there's gonna be a whole variety of price points for existing stores, typically driven by their size and obviously the uh, amount of revenue and particularly net revenue that those stores are generating. So you have sort of a sliding scale and you know, typically uh, the stores that are priced on a lower basis are either small stores with lower revenues and or have some kind of major challenge, uh, typically related to the equipment or the lease. Those that are uh, on the higher end of the scale, if we're asking, tend to be larger stores and tend to be in a better spot with respect to equipment and the lease. And I'll talk about both those a little bit more as we go along. For building out a new store, and let's use a definition of going into an existing retail space, okay? whether it's a vanilla box or being used for a different purpose right now, and we need to take that spot and make it into a laundromat, not including the real estate. So we're talking about uh, space that you're leasing. We're talking about any leasehold improvements to make it a laundromat. We're talking about buying the equipment, installing the equipment and getting up and running. I think the easiest way to talk about that with lots of caveats, because there's so many different variables that go into the play. I think if you start at three or $400 a square foot, uh, that would at least give you a pretty solid starting point. Um, certainly, I see projects that go for more and projects that go for less. But if you start at three or $400 a square foot, it starts to give you an idea of what the total project cost will look like uh, for uh, anything that you're considering. So yeah, even a modest size store today is going to be the better part of a million bucks, uh, certainly several hundred thousand dollars. So you, you need to sort of build your plan with that in mind if you intend to build out uh, a new store. Now, if you are gonna put up a building or purchase the real estate, then obviously uh, that's how you get into the uh, couple million dollar uh, range for these projects. One of the other big uh, considerations that I run into uh, with members that I'm consulting with each day is a matter of scarcity. There just aren't a lot of stores for sale or there aren't a lot of stores for sale that meet my criteria. Um, and or they're, we're having trouble finding a, a, a good site for a new build. Uh, location is so important uh, as evidence in your questions about demographics and how to find a good location. So that notion of scarcity is something that I think uh, comes up quite frequently in these conversations. Because not only are you trying to sort of bird dog locations to build on or stores to buy, uh, you've got a lot of other people that are out there looking right now. It's a very hot topic, uh, the laundromat business. And remember that a lot of the existing operators, people that already have one or two, are looking for that third, fourth, or fifth location. So there's just a lot of eyeballs on locations and stores to purchase. So I don't say that to dissuade you. I say that to kind of manage your expectations about how quickly you might be able to identify that opportunity. Another factor that I've uh, come to understand really well over the years, uh, three decades of, of taking these questions, is that you know a lot of people have to understand that laundromats are a place of public accommodation. And so there are some uh, security issues that you need to address and just know that you're dealing with the public. And anytime you're dealing with the public, that can uh, mean some headaches. And so uh, an example I hear a lot of these days is that based on uh, the locations for uh, good laundromats, 
you're going to uh, be uh, confronted with uh, people uh, maybe misbehaving, maybe confronted with people that are addicted or people that may be unhoused. Um, so again, I don't see any of that to be dissuading, but I want you to understand what the day-to-day -day could look like. And again, there's things you can do to help mitigate some of those challenges. But And I found that people that I've worked with, again, it's not a good or bad thing. They've had a kind of a higher tolerance and a, are more effective in dealing in that environment and have people that say, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm, I'm not uh, uh, prepared to, to deal with the, the public in that particular way. So I just want to always put that out there on some of the challenges to kind of balance off some of the great things about the industry and give you a level-headed look. Uh, so let me jump back into the questions here. I think Aaron had asked the next one up. Is there an industry standard net profit uh, of the top line revenue? Uh, laundromats are all over the board, Aaron. We've got plenty of stores that never achieve uh, net profitability and some that have some gaudy numbers. Um, I think that uh, if we're looking at, at operational net, in other words, not taking into consideration any debt service that you're working with, I think most people would tell you that you know a 25% or so margin uh, is something that uh, people would feel pretty comfortable about. Um, again, higher or lower is certainly uh, commonplace uh, as well, uh, but it really depends on managing three main factors, rent, utilities, and payroll. Um, this is kind of back to the, it's not easy, but it's simple. That's the, those are really the, the, the main considerations, and I'll give you some um, uh, expense ratios to go on here in a few minutes that'll help you understand that a little bit better. But if you had to kind of put me on the spot, I would say 25% would be what most people would tell you in the industry. Uh, Darren, the typical build out and equipping costs, I just uh, shared that, so anticipated your question there by a couple minutes, but uh, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, Jabaris's question is, if you are new, should you start in the state you live or doesn't it matter? Uh, you know, a lot of our members feel really strongly about this, Jabaris, that you've got to be close to the store. Um, even I think if I had 100 veteran laundromat owners sitting behind me, they would say uh, be within a 20 minute to 30 minute drive. Um, because while on the one hand, you don't need to be there all those hours of operation, there's a lot of flexibility, uh, but you do need to respond to issues. So someone doesn't show up or there's an equipment leak or the water heater goes down or uh, there's some kind of, you know, something that happens, you know, Murphy's Law, uh, you want to be able to get there in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I'll give you an example. I had another member call me last week, had five locations. You, uh, she was calling up to let me know that she had sold one of the locations. I said, wait, 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 let me guess. The, the store that's furthest away from home. Yep. <laughs> I would say 90% of the time when I ask that question, the answer is, yeah, I sold the store that's furthest away. Now, conversely, to be fair, um, kind of this um, remote ownership of laundromats has become more common, not common, more common than it had been in the past. And I think that's driven by a couple of factors. One and one and one is technology, the ability to um, see into that store. So that is not just you know, like security, like being able to see on video into your store to help manage it from a longer distance. Uh, the network ability of the equipment itself, so you can see in real time performance information, financial information about the store. The use of payment systems that typically result in a lot less cash in the store. Um, those are all factors that tend to make it easier, not easy, but easier than it used to be to uh, manage a store that's two hours away or two states away. But the conventional wisdom is stay close to home. Okay, great questions. You're doing amazing. We've got 20 minutes and keep those questions coming in. I'm going to roar through some of the remaining prepared content because these are topics that have come up. I about fell out of my chair because this question hasn't come up yet <laughs> in the chat, which is uh, how to value a laundromat, what's the laundromat worth? And it's okay because it's about a three hour topic to do it any justice. But if I had to boil it down to just a couple of things here, um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, again, a longer conversation, but if I had to boil it down, I would say most laundromats sell between three and five times that operating income, the net, not the gross, 
And again, we're assuming that we're not dealing with real estate, just purchasing uh, the business. Now, that is a range you could drive a truck through. And there are plenty of stores that sell for one or two times. There's plenty of stores that sell for six or seven times. So it's probably more important to kind of talk through some of the considerations that, that manage that. So um, the, the, the main drivers for laundromat value uh, certainly is the net, you know, how profitable is the store. But right behind that is the age and condition of the equipment and the duration and the cost of the lease. Okay, so you can't pick up and move a laundromat. So the lease and the duration of the lease becomes incredibly important. And some would argue that's the main thing that you're buying when you buy a laundromat is that assignment or transfer of the lease to you, uh, enabling you to operate that business uh, during that remaining time on the lease. Um, equipment, you know, equipment is expensive and it's a big part of that uh, three or $400 square foot starting point I gave you a few minutes ago. And so um, putting it another way, stores on the high end of that scale of three to five times or perhaps even commanding more would be likely to be a higher volume store uh, with an, uh, an above average uh, profitability margin equipment that's been recently replaced or at least in kind of the front half of their lifespan. And there's at least uh, 10 to 15 years remaining on the lease. Now stores that are at either unsaleable or at one or two multiple or the lower end of that scale tend to be stores that have old, old, old equipment and have uh, less than 10 years left on the lease. And, and over time, because of those first two things, generally inform the fact that the store isn't performing as well uh, as it could be. So um, it's a longer conversation. We've got webinars, we've got videos, we've got a great white paper on valuation, but those are the first couple of things I wanted to share with you. Due diligence is a major consideration because you're buying a cash business. And um, the level of record keeping among sellers um, often leaves something to be desired. So uh, the due diligence, again, we've got a lot of great background information on tips and, and uh, tactics for conducting the due diligence. But like I said, at the end of the day, the level, quality and quantity of the competition, uh, what kind of condition the lease is in, uh, the equipment age, those are really drivers uh, toward um, setting that value. So that's the quick run through on valuation. Okay, let me just make sure I've caught up on the questions. I think I am. All right, let's jump into uh, revisit another topic, which is some of the dollars and cents. So I talked about how the financing works, uh, at least in most part, but what I didn't have for you is some of the uh, cash requirements. So um, these days for a new store, uh, I would say, I would probably amend this to be 30% um, on the end of the scale. So. Uh, the lenders today are probably looking for 30% of that total project cost uh, for building out a new store, again, excluding real estate, uh, to have uh, cash in hand and obviously the qualifications to uh, borrow the balance and guarantee the balance. For acquisitions, uh, the, that down payment tends to be more like 30 to 40% of the asking price. Um, but again, you know, it's really in, uh, from the perspective of either the, with the seller is looking for if they're gonna offer some seller financing, which is less and less common, uh, or using one of the conventional lenders, uh, you know, via the SBA or otherwise, and then using the industry lenders, I would start to look at that closer to that 30 to 40% range. But uh, one of the bigger mistakes I see people make, there's two main mistakes I see people make, opening, buying and opening the store, or building and opening the store with their last dollar, and not having enough, um, cushion to deal with unexpected expenses that come up or even things just like marketing, uh, putting coins in the changers and what these days could be some obnoxious um, deposits that the utility companies are looking for to set up, uh, set up new accounts. Uh, the other main mistake that I see people make is they pay for a laundromat, they buy a laundromat with old equipment under the understanding that it's perfectly fine and then find out within the first couple of months that the equipment is uh, impossible to maintain based on its age and it's just not performing very well. And then they're having to turn around and try to uh, scare up the resources to 
put money down on new equipment to re-equip the store. So those are two common mistakes, and I've alluded to those here as we've uh, had the conversation. Okay, keep those questions coming. I promised uh, some information about expense ratios uh, based on some of the questions that had come up earlier. So these are things that show up in our annual benchmarking survey. If you needed one more reason to dive in, become a member of the association, we have a lot of great uh, statistical information and benchmarking information about existing laundromats. Utilities, 20 to 25% of gross sales. So I'm presenting this to you as an expense ratio. For every dollar of revenue, uh, 20 or 25 cents going out the door in utilities. Now, teaching point. Some of the older, tired laundromats that you may be looking at to purchase, don't be surprised if those were at 30 or 35%. And again, that's a kind of a shortcut of math you can do to really understand uh, the profit, profitability or lack thereof of a store that you may be looking to purchase. Conversely, a brand new store or a store that's been recently totally re-equipped you might see 15% or 12% or 11%. So the variable cost in a laundromat is the utilities. And that has everything to do with your profitability. So if you have an old store with old equipment, yeah, it still runs, but you're running 30 or 35% or more to pay the utility bills. Conversely, with new equipment, uh, you're able to keep that sub 15% and it makes a world of difference in that uh, margin uh, that I think Darren was asking about a bit earlier. So to kind of paint out that picture further, rent, you want it to be as low as possible, but certainly most um, of our members would say you want to keep that tops 20 to 25% of gross sales. And then payroll, uh, I might want to bump this to 15 to 20% given uh, increases in minimum wage and just the wage scale that's gone up over the last two years. But those are the main expenses that I said to you earlier, utilities, rent, and payroll. And the lower the expense ratios you're able to achieve here, uh, the more profitable the store you're going to find. And depending on the cash on cash uh, uh, calculation of ROI uh, to, uh, again, I think it was Darren's question earlier, if you look at it from an ROI standpoint, again, this 20 to 30, maybe 35% is something that people will, will look at. But again, successful laundromats done right with all these factors in place are really important caveats uh, to add to the conversation. Okay, about a dozen minutes to go, so feel free to pump in a few more questions here. Uh, one of the other real common questions, and I won't read this back to you, but one of the more common questions that I come across is buy versus build, buy versus build, buy versus build. And, you know, there are good arguments to make for both, and there's drawbacks to both. And so, like most things in business, it really depends on the situation. So, what I often recommend to our new investor members is keep an open mind and judge each opportunity on its own merits. So whether that's an opportunity to build a store or an opportunity to acquire a store. And then, you know, you can see here what may be kind of obvious, but the pros and cons to, the, to these approaches. Simply put, building a new laundromat, the upside is new cells, it's bright, clean, new, you're gonna probably automatically be the best store in your market. The cons is the cost and the risk because there hasn't been a laundromat in that location previously. Buying a store, the, 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 the pro right out of the gate is it's a known entity. It's up and running and it's got an existing cash flow. The flip side of that is that it often has a challenge with either the condition of the store itself, the age of the uh, equipment, uh, and or uh, a shorter end of the lease uh, that you're taking a look at. So you need to take all those things, throw them in the pot, and, and really understand what that opportunity looks like for you. Aaron, uh, do you have an equipment vendor list that are members of the association? I'm glad you asked. Uh, we have a directory on our website. Our website is coinlaundry.org, and there is a directory of both uh, distributors that you can find by state, uh, but also uh, the manufacturers of equipment and the various service providers uh, and technology companies. So we have a good, uh, there's gotta be 125 <laughs> distributors on that list and there's at least 50 or 60 on the uh, manufacturer and service provider list. So we appreciate them supporting the association, which means they're supporting you. And yes, you can find that directory on our website. If I hadn't talked about leases enough, here's one more slide on leases, just to remind you that 
this business, uh, the real secret beyond some of those expense factors I mentioned earlier is the lease. And it's, you, you cannot reasonably pick up and move the laundromat. So you've got a cash flow, an existing cash flow, and then you've got a lease that can protect that cash flow for a finite amount of time into the period, uh, into the future period. So um, I see people saying, oh, Brian, there's a, a store for sale. It's got three years left on the lease. Well, that's not gonna cut it. Now you can make an offer contingent upon negotiating additional time on the lease. But again, I would view it as it's incumbent upon the seller to try to add that value. But um, you can make that uh, part of uh, the deal that you're working on. And uh, But it's all about the lease. You can't operate without a good lease. And again, you need to be able to project those costs through the uh, potential lifetime of that lease. So let's say you've got what most people would say, if I could write my lease, it's a five-year lease with an additional three five-year options. So a total of 20 years or 25 years. Um, but you also need to understand what the rent escalations are through that whole period. Because if you have a sort of an open-ended, at the end of five years, we'll do market rent or we'll negotiate the rent. I only view that as having a five-year lease. I don't see that as having a 10, 15, or 20-year lease. The rent escalations need to be spelled out and understood, and you definitely need to use an expert you know, to help you along the way. But again, we've got great white papers on leases, videos, webinars. We've got a lot of more information uh, about leases that can help you. Okay, all right. You've done a great job asking questions along the way here, and I'm certainly happy to take a few more in the eight minutes or so that we have remaining, but I thought I'd also take this opportunity to share a few other resources that you can tap into if you've taken in this conversation and you think like you want to continue to pursue the industry um, and uh, I want to give you a few more tools that can help you. Um, one thing that you can uh, take in mind here is that on uh, Coin Laundry Association's YouTube channel, we've got an FAQ list. And what I've done is I've created eight videos that take the most common questions that I see, especially popping up on Facebook, <laughs> about the laundromat industry. So these are bite-sized, five to seven minute videos taking on the basic questions. I think that could be a good resource for you. So just go right to the YouTube channel for Coin Laundry Association, or when you get your copy of this presentation, you can use that link. Uh, you're welcome, Darren, our pleasure. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that We've got a lot of follow-on resources specifically for new laundromat entrepreneurs. We've got consultations, we've got white papers, books, surveys, uh, lots of other things, but becoming a member is really probably the best value because it includes all these uh, different resources. And um, every person that joins the association gets a link to my personal calendar to book time for a consultation. So I just did one this morning and I've got one, two more this afternoon. So I'm talking with, New members all the time. We can talk about your needs, your project, and try to give you the benefit of our knowledge base within the industry. And as I've often said, spend a few hundred dollars before you spend a few hundred thousand, right? You're not the first one to do this. There's lots of information available to help you. Um, another resource that uh, I wanna share with you is our Facebook group, Laundromat Professionals Network. It's a good place to reach out with your questions and it's uh, getting more and more populated with our member companies and people that are willing to help you there. So laundromat professionals is another thing that you can take advantage of. For those of you uh, women that are uh, logging in here, uh, know that we have a specific women's laundry network. And so um, if you're looking for additional networking and mentoring focused on uh, women in small business, this is a great resource uh, that you can take advantage of. There are monthly uh, virtual meetings and usually at least one annual in-person uh, meeting for that. So just wanted to make sure that you knew that that was another resource available. Uh, Renzo, yes, everyone will get a, uh, automatically get a copy of the webinar uh, in your inbox, uh, given your registration for this. Uh, looking ahead to next year, we do a lot of in-person uh, meetings through the association. Our next blockbuster event is Excellence in Laundry. This is something that we do uh, most years, and it is really geared toward bringing the best speakers together along with the best of the best multi-store operators. But I'll tell you a little secret, um, it's great for new investors because you're rubbing elbows with the best of the best. And in 2024, we are adding an additional concurrent track of sessions just for new investors. 
So uh, registration for that will open up in January, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to mark your calendars now uh, for Excellence in Laundry 2024. Another thing to keep in mind as you're getting started on the business is that one of the, one of the things that we do in addition to advocacy and networking um, and education at the association is that we have business solutions. So we have vetted a number of partners that help with some of the basic things that you're going to need. Probably our most prominent, we're celebrating our 35th anniversary of our CLA insurance program. And so laundromat insurance is not like other insurance. And so um, I would certainly encourage you as you go through this process, whether you're buying or building, uh, to uh, make sure that you access our insurance program, coinlaundryinsurance.com uh, is the resource there. And we can help you. We've been doing this a long time and all we do is insure laundromats. So uh, we have that expertise. Um, another thing to keep in mind is AMP. Uh, that's our digital marketing program. So if you're looking for just the basics to get yourself started with perfecting your Google listing and getting some video on board and some photography, uh, getting your basic website together, um, that is uh, really a tremendous resource and it's very affordable through the association and several others there that you could take advantage of, but I just wanted to preview a couple of those services. Uh, one thing you absolutely need to do is go to planetlaundry.com and subscribe to our magazine. Yes, an in-print magazine. Of course, there's a digital version, but uh, we have now, what, uh, 33 years of publishing Planet Laundry magazine. We've got an incredible archive. Uh, so really just a tremendous magazine that's all about the laundromat business, hearing best practices from the best operators. It's free to subscribe, uh, so uh, please do so. And again, for those of you that are looking to put together a business plan, uh, the archive of past issues is going to be super valuable to you. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, our role here as a nonprofit trade association is to try to push the industry forward educate, advocate, uh, bring people together for networking and provide you with business services. Uh, these are some ways you can find us on the social channels, but uh, I hope this was a helpful one hour uh, to help you understand a little bit more about the laundromat industry. We remain here and available to help you uh, continue that journey. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us and I hope to see you again at a future uh, webinar or future educational opportunity. Uh, we're excited to work with you as you get into the business. So. Uh, with that, I think we'll sign off. Know that you're going to get a copy of this in the in, in the uh, inbox after the uh, program, uh, about within a 24 hour or so period, and uh, look forward to working with you again down the road. Thanks so much.